Well, John Lydon, a.k.a. Johnny Rotten, knows a thing or two about being uncensored, and that's why he's back for another instalment of Johnny's Rotten World. And he joins me now, live from the Cotswolds in England. Looking, I have to say, John, you look like a, a, a real member of the landed British gentry there. I'm proper, and I'm in the middle of recording, so, <laughs> you know, if you're going to respect your music, dress appropriately. <laughs> How are you, Pierce? I'm good, thanks, John. <laughs> Great to have you back. Uh, a lot of stuff going on I want yeah. to talk to you about. I'll tell you the first one that struck me. As, as the man that gave us anarchy in the UK, what do you make of this attempt by Scotland to force another referendum and break away from the UK? And it comes at a time when many people think a united Ireland might then follow, and we may see the end of the United Kingdom. How do you feel about that? Uh, it it's, it's swings and roundabouts and political trickery, and I, I'm unimpressed by all of them, and they have been for many, many a decade, uh, and, and particularly that, that, that Scottish lady. Uh, I think she's highly deceitful, and she's going to cause some serious problems down the line. Would you, would you it be ain't sad? Our fault. We didn't build Hadrian's Wall. <laughs> <laughs> would you be sad? Would you be sad to see Scotland go off on its own? No, because have you ever tried spending Scottish money in England? <laughs> <laughs> it's not easy. No, it ain't. It's not easy finding I a Scot Scotland, to spend any you, money. You know, period. Our, our gigs there are some of the best uh, and finest we've ever done. Uh, to me, these are me people, and uh, the political shenanigans and the divisiveness is like, a, I think, ultimately irrelevant and a fiasco. Did uh, you... it, it will all backfire on them. It always does, and if it doesn't, I'll be there to make sure it will. <laughs> we had uh, Nicola Sturgeon, the lady you talked about, the leader of the SNP in Scotland. She met the Queen today, which must have been a pretty difficult conversation, I would imagine, and it came as uh, Prince Charles... Uh, let it be known he would no longer be accepting bags of cash for his charities after three million yeah, yeah, euros worth of stuffed about? in Fortnum and Mason bags. Yeah, what did you make of that? Well, I reckon... I, well done, Charlie, you've joined the working class. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever had three million stuffed in a Fortnum and Mason's bag, John? <coughs> No, I, I heard yesterday it was one million, and these figures are going to juxtaposition up and down ad infinitum. Like, I don't know what that's about. Personally, I think it's really none of my business, right? Well, did, yeah, I mean, until, I suppose the until, argument until, is... Until it's proved... I mean, the argument I would say to you... proved differently. Yeah, I mean, the argument is that he's the future king. The king is very much all of our business in the sense that we pay for the upkeep of the royal family. Oh, so well, I guess... study your history, Pierce. Kings have been collecting money like that <laughs> since the dawn of kings. That is true. <laughs> so do, should, we, should we care? If, it, if it's all going to the charity anyway, should we care? Does it matter how the charity gets this money? Well, I, I would... If that be the truth, then, I, then I'm quite happy that the millions go tax-free to charity. Because one of my biggest problems is every time I donate, I get taxed on it. Mm. All right? So I think, well done, Bonnie. Bonnie Prince Charlie, the Scottish connection. <laughs> Did you catch any of, of Glastonbury, John? No. No, we, we almost played there. They, they gave us an offer, but it was so underwhelming financially that there was no point to it. <laughs> I've heard there's been people moaning. There's been people moaning that, like, uh, old fellas are having fun. Yeah. You know? Oh, for God's sake. And it's an old fella doing the moaning. What, it, what is the as oldest... As far as I'm concerned. What is the oldest, John, that you th What's the oldest you would feel comfortable performing in front of a big crowd? Well, if Paul McCartney can do that, right? Accolades, accolades, right? Fantastic, right? I think you should keep going and going and going like the Duracell bunny until you finally run out. It seems interesting because I watched, I watched McCartney. McCartney's set, I thought, was actually really good, mainly because his back catalogue of songs is so incredible, but also I think he's, he's been quite careful about the kind of song he sings so that his voice doesn't get exposed, because obviously not as strong as it was well, when he was you know, in his 30s. But Diana Ross, I felt, sadly, um, 
she's got some great songs, obviously. She's two years younger than McCartney. But actually, on, watching it on TV at home, I thought her voice was, was pretty awful. Uh, what do we do oh, with yes. what do we no, do with icons? Lost, she's lost it. She's lost in a chorus of backing vocalists. Yeah, right? and, and that's kind of grim. But I don't care. I absolutely grew up and loved Diana Ross yeah. to death. Right? Does it matter? At any age? Does it I matter? They I can't don't care perform at the same level. Rattle off her. I love her. Right? But, love I mean, her. Should it, should love it, her. Should Keep it matter? Keep going, babies. The, the only one I'd knock is Mick Jagger, because he's rubbish. But the rest, <laughs> I have you all. Well, you know what? I had this debate. I had this debate the other day about Mick Jagger, because I don't think he's ever been a very good singer. He's a great rock star performer and a great dancer, but I don't think yeah. he's a great singer, is he? He must have connections, man, to get away with that for so long. <laughs> Hello. I mean, I've, I've been criticised as not being a great singer, but my classic example by way of explanation is, well, neither is that, right? Mm. <laughs> is it something like that? I don't know, you know? <laughs> That's what you get when you hang out with, you know, the elite. I got fair play to him and all that, but it's uh, there is no such thing as old codgers, right? There's just people wanting fun at any age, right? Don't let governments dictate to you what time you should give up and collect your pension. Uh, those are the kind of rules that lefty fools follow, not us proper people. Do you uh, think? Do you think we should all? You know, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to kick the donkey to the bitter end. I sort of, I do agree with you. I mean, I sort of do believe in the philosophy of growing old disgracefully, because why wouldn't you? Who wants to grow old boringly oh, and, and, you know, yeah. behaving yourself? I, I, yeah, I, I remember when I was young, I used to think, like, how great it would be if I got put in an old folks' home. Imagine the terror I could get up to. <laughs> <laughs> when you go around, when you go around, John, uh, with all the hype around the Sex Pistols series that's come out and everything, and obviously he's put the pistols back in all the headlines and stuff. What kind of reaction do you get from, from the British public these days? Oh, uh, very, very favourable and pro me because they know I was the man what wrote the songs, created the image, performed it live and had to live with the experience. Whereas this bunch of fake wannabes are nothing like that. Mm. And it, it's quite laughable, really. Um, that, that pill gigs now, what it used to be, Pistols audience are now fully, fully wrapped around us, right? They know this is nonsense. This should never have happened, man. How can you cut out the songwriter and think you're going to do anything at all to make mm. the world a better place? Mm. I, I completely agree. The Pistols without you is just not the Pistols. What do you make, John, of the, of the strikes that are going on at the moment in this country with a lot of different companies and a lot of different unions wanting to take on the companies at a time when we're already in a pretty serious financial situation? Do you support the strikers? Yeah, no, I don't. It, 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 six of one, half a dozen of the other. Some of those strikes actually seriously affected us on tour. Right? Our tour bus kept breaking down, so we'd have to uh, find alternative means of transport. And one of them would, of course, be trains. Mm. Oh, no, the trains are on strike. It seems like England has this, this perpetual motion of self-destroying itself mm. just when it could be saved. And that's how I view strikes as, as unnecessary. If you don't like the job, sod off and get another one, right? But... Trains keep the country running. I can't, I can't change that. That's an actual fact. I mean, we're seeing... Well, we're seeing, I think, the Royal Mail... Has, anybody I think the Royal so Mail voted... Back. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the Royal Mail voted today to go on strike as well. We're seeing the airline uh, crews now wanting to do the same. It, it's sort of spreading like, like a virus, yeah. which, ironic, given that we just come out of a pandemic or still coming out of it, uh, involving a real virus. But yeah. it just feel like everyone yeah. now yeah, is yeah, just yeah. trying to you know, exploit the situation to me. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm very worried that it's the same people behind all of these orchestrated manoeuvres. It really is just all about destroying everything. Uh, this secret agenda Karl Marx nonsense. I mean, my God, man, young kids are supporting a professional parasite mm. as a political doctrine. 
And, and here we go. I, I, I was watching some of the union officials the other morning on TV and a blather out of it. It was so 50 years ago didn't mm. work. Stop it. Grow up. Move mm. on. Fix it. Sick of them. You know what, John? I, Sick of them. I don't disagree. I think the timing of all this it could not be worse. Just when the country is getting back on its feet, it's wham bam. Oh, I think it's deliberate. We're flattened. I think it yeah, is yeah, deliberate, yeah. yeah. It's exploiting the situation. Yeah. Uh, before we let you go, John, yeah. um, a little bit of good news here. And I wanted you to join me in embracing and celebrating this. So there's a cricket team called the Motley Crew, which I thought you would like. Not the actual Motley Crew that you know. <clears throat> this is a cricket team called the Motley Crew in Faversham in Kent, formed 29 years ago in 1993. They have been the most useless cricket team in the history of cricket. They've never, <laughs> ever, ever won a game until <laughs> Sunday. And on Sunday, they finally <laughs> broke the habit of their entire life they chased down 134 against a team from the Three Horseshoes pub in nearby Hearn Hill. They had a one-wicket win, and the all-rounder Bobby Dolan said, I didn't think this day would ever come, but to be fair, we sneaked one net session in on Wednesday. <laughs> they celebrated their momentous oh. win by toasting their crestfallen opponents. Yeah. But I just think, I'm a massive cricket fan, but... This is so English, isn't it? I You've got you this, are, this team not, of perennial so. <laughs> losers and they finally win a game. What do you make of that? Oh, I think that's, like, very good. I'm really happy for them, right? But mm. honestly, Pierce, I hate cricket. I, I, <laughs> you I can't hate way, cricket, you John. You all lose all the time. <laughs> you cannot hate cricket. If you hate cricket, you hate life. Motley Crue, huh? I hope they don't get done for copyright over the name. <laughs> well, they might, won't they? They might. I think they spell it a bit. Oh, I think they spell imagine it... that, you know? You know what American <laughs> lawyers are like? I've just had to deal with Disney World. <laughs> uh, out of interest, have you ever been partying with Motley Crue, John? Uh, I, I know a few of them, yeah. They're all right. They are. They're know? good lads. People I actually... are not quite... We're not quite like what we're supposed to be according to the tabloids. Mm. Actually, sometimes we're worse. <laughs> right. and I, I, can't, I can't go into details, but I, interviewed I am a them. survivor. I interviewed them at the Whiskey A Go Go in Sunset Boulevard, and they changed the awning outside to, for one night only, Motley Crue and Piers Morgan. And it was actually probably the greatest moment of my life. Oh, that's that. a good one, isn't it? It was great. I've, I hope you got that in your bedroom wall. I have. I've got it on the loo wall, actually. Uh, John, I've got to leave it there. What it's great to catch up with you. Think you've got two Motley Crews in your house. <laughs> <laughs> John Lydon, great God to talk you, to you. Yes, good, good having a chat. Sir. Come back soon. All enjoy right? the Cotswolds. You look, you look very Cotswolds. I will. <laughs> Take care. All the best. Over and out. <laughs>